Our last speaker for the day will be Mohamed Akhtar, who will give a talk that's possibly the mirror counterpart to the previous one. I guess we'll find out. Uh, anyway, it's about using mirror symmetry to classify Fano varieties. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's a great honor for me to be here uh, to speak to you about an emerging circle of ideas which uh, intends to use mirror symmetry as a means to uh, tackle classification problems in algebraic geometry. So the problem that I'd like to focus on today is the classification of Fano manifolds up to deformation. And for simplicity, I'd like to restrict ourselves to the case of surfaces, uh, Fano orbifold surfaces, uh, which is in some sense a model test case for the more general classification problems that you might want to consider. And um, nonetheless, I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that one can see already many interesting questions and interesting phenomena even in this uh, very basic setting. So let me begin with an overview of what I'd like to speak to, to speak to you about today. So let me begin with a, a, a rough remark. Roughly speaking, final varieties correspond to Laurent polynomials under mirror symmetry. That's not entirely precise, but that's a, that's a rough idea that I'd like to start with. So I have a, a final article. Uh, and under mirror symmetry, it corresponds to uh, a long So if you're interested in classification, what you might hope is that you could take the question of classifying final orbifolds up to uh, deformation via mirror symmetry, translate it into a set of questions involving Laurent polynomials. And this is precisely the content of the proposal uh, made in 2012 by uh, Tom Coates, Alessio Porti, uh, Sergei Galkin, Vasily Golishev, and Alexander Kapcher. And so this proposal is based on earlier work of Vasily Golishev, where he used similar ideas to uh, give a, a new classification for rank 1 final threefolds. And the proposal is precisely what we've just been, what, what I've just said. Uh, in order to classify final orbifolds, you should try and study the Laurent polynomial mirrors. So classify uh, final orbifolds by studying the Laurent polynomial mirrors. So the first thing I should say about this proposal, or rather this philosophy, is that it really isn't restricted in any way by the dimension of the final order folds you want to consider. The ultimate aim of this sort of uh, emerging theory is to develop enough techniques to tackle higher dimensional classification problems, such as, for instance, the problem of classifying smooth final four folds or smooth final four folds of higher dimension. Uh, this is a problem for which I don't think very much is known at the moment. So, but, but one has to start somewhere, and so recently uh, there was a uh, sort of co uh, collaboration by a lot of people whose names you can see up there uh, to try and develop a precise uh, conjectural framework to test this philosophy in the, case of, uh, in the case of surfaces. And so after these investigations, some of those references you can see above, the conjectural picture that emerged, the conjectural picture, For surfaces is as follows. Uh, suppose that I want to classify certain final orbifolds. So I'll make this precise in, in a little while, but let's say I want to classify certain final orbifolds up to up to certain deformations. Then conjecturally, this set, this set of geometric objects, equivalence classes of final orbifolds, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of, a set of combinatorial objects, more precisely 
uh, uh, the set of certain lattice polygons up to an equivalence relation which has now come to be known as a combinatorial mutation. <coughs> conjectural picture, in order to classify final orbifolds, one should try and classify these uh, combinatorial objects, these combinatorial mutation classes of lattice polygons. So, but how does one really detect that if I have an equivalence class here, it corresponds to a class in the, in the other set? And the sort of uh, idea for this is the following. Suppose that I have uh, a deformation class of a final orbifold X, and suppose it corresponds to uh, the combinatorial mutation class of some uh, lattice polygon P. And so, so I have this correspondence, and conjecturally I should be able to detect this via the following procedure. I start with P, the equivalence class, and from this I construct a Laurent polynomial F. Or more precisely, I construct something called an algebraic mutation class of Laurent polynomials. And if x corresponds to p, then I should be able to detect this by matching x in f via uh, a rule known as mirror duality. So to say that again, if x corresponds to p, I should be able to construct an algebraic mutation class for all polynomials from p, which corresponds to x under mirror duality, which we'll define in a second. And Moreover, the hope is that uh, once you have this mirror duality, then the equivalence class, uh, the, or rather once you know that you have an algebraic mutation class, a mirror dual to some kind of, uh, in this way, then the equivalence class XD can be reconstructed uh, from, from, uh, from F. Um, by deforming uh, the toric variety x subscript f, which is just the toric variety defined by the spanning fan of the Newton polygon f. And just as an aside, because there are a lot of symplectic geometers in the audience, <coughs> I should say what fan I'm considering. So if I want to consider p2, for instance, uh, I would consider this polygon. Sorry, Mohammed, can you write about twice as big I from no one? I will do my best to write twice. Um, uh, so if I want to construct P2, then this is the polygon I start with, and this is the, um, this is the fan. So um, this is the face fan, I guess, in N, rather than the inner normal fan in, uh, in N. So the aim of today's talk will be to try and expand upon uh, various aspects of this conjectural picture and hopefully to give you some evidence in support of, uh, of this. So um, some evidence that this, this, this expectation of classifying final orbifolds uh, via classifying just purely combinatorial objects actually, that it actually has some, uh, some meaning to it. Okay. So, let me start again and try to be a little bit more precise this time. Uh, I'll try by I'll start by specifying the class of final orbifolds that I'd like to consider. So the toric um, so in this whole picture, the sort of technology coming from toric geometry is very important, and so roughly what you would like is you would like final orbifolds that somehow degenerate to uh, toric variety. So more precisely, we want to consider final orbifolds of class Tg, that is, the final orbifold x is of um, class Cg. That's, uh, that's short for toric generalization. Q 
Gorenstein which I'll abbreviate throughout by QG if it admits a Q Gorenstein degeneration with reduced fibers Normal torque, uh, normal uh, torque on the surface. So the technical bit of this uh, of this definition is this notion of Q-Bornstein degeneration. Um, so I won't, um, in the interest of time, I will avoid giving the precise definition of it. But let me give you a way to think about it. A Kirgorenstein degeneration is a, a flat degeneration, so somehow the fibers behave continuously. And moreover, the anti-canonical divisor is well behaved in such degenerations. In particular, uh, the degree is preserved, uh, is locally constant on the base. Or locally constant on the base. So it's just a degeneration where the anti-canonical is kind of way well behaved. Um, do, do you still have a translation on the component of non canonical the canonical that you degenerate into? Pardon me? I mean the torus action that you have from the toric uh, from the toric uh, funnel that your surface that you're degenerating towards the funnel before. Does it extend to the, to the funnel in the complement of the anti-canonical body? I don't know. Great, sorry. Um, is it part of the conjecture picture that the all these polygons actually come from some torus penetration? Uh, but also, I don't, I don't know very well. Are they convergent? Uh, for <coughs> some like final or default, which does not have any sensible torus uh, vibration. No, I can't. I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll uh, become more clear as we go along. Um, shall, shall I think? Uh, okay, so let me um, start by giving you some examples of, um, of some things that are of class TG. First of all, suppose that I have a, a smooth final surface. Uh, so these are sometimes called Delpezzo surfaces. Uh, if, you, if you're smooth from a surface, then you're, um, the result is that you're automatically of class TG. And one way to see this is just by explicit uh, calculation. So there are some, there's some work of 40 codes uh, et al. Uh, where they explicitly show this by just going through the list of Delpezzo surfaces. And the second is more a remark on what q Bornstein degenerations are. Uh, what, 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 what we need for Q-Gorenstein degeneration. So if we have a Q-Gorenstein deformation, then uh, of X, then they preserve uh, the, the sections of the anti-canonical. So in particular, Uh, if, 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 the, if the sections, if the H naught of the anti-canonical is zero, then X is not of class TG. <coughs> and the way to see this is purely combinatorial. You want to consider, uh, so if, if X is of class TG, then it admits a degeneration to uh, some toric, uh, uh, toric final surface. And it corresponds in particular to something called the final polytope. Uh, we'll discuss these in a, in a few minutes. So for such final polytopes, the anti-canonical divisor is encoded by the dual polytope. In particular, the lattice points of the dual uh, encode the sections of the anti-canonical. And so the dual polytope has at least one interior lattice point. In particular, this quantity has to be at least one if x admits a, a QG, uh, is, if x is of class TG. So, so that's the reason behind this, and uh, the example of such a thing is, uh, so uh, if I take the complete intersection uh, of two hypersurfaces of degree 6 inside P two twos and 3, 3, 3, then this is not class TG. 
um, for this, this reason uh, that I've just said here. If you want more examples of such things, then you should look in the paper CH, where there are at least three, new, uh, three examples of things which are non capacitive And so given this, this setup, the main problem that we want to consider, our classification problem, is to classify uh, TG final surfaces up to QG deformation. So this, uh, this somehow makes precise a little bit more the left-hand side, or the, the right-hand side too, of, uh, of this diagram. So the certain phanelographs are class TG, and the certain deformations are the ones that are called conformance. Okay. So let me now explain uh, this notion of uh, mirror duality, how a Laurent polynomial corresponds to a TG final surface. Or rather, if one was one didn't have this picture, one might start with the question, what sort of Laurent polynomials do you expect to correspond to TG final surfaces under mirror symmetry? And so this is uh, captured in a notion called mirror duality, which I'll explain presently. So um, let me again start with a, a rough statement uh, based on work of uh, uh, Iguchi, Hardy, and Sean which says that um, a Laurent polynomial mirror to, uh, to a final x encodes the ground witten theory of x in some way. So, if you want Laurent polynomials to correspond to final varieties, you try, one would try to capture this sort of uh, this, uh, this relationship in some way. And the way this is done within the uh, within the framework of this program is as follows: the so definition uh, a TG final surface is mirror dual. Uh, a Laurent polynomial. So I'm working with surfaces, so I want to consider Laurent polynomials in two variables. In general, if I was working with n folds, final n folds, then I would consider Laurent polynomials in n variables. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so x, a TG final surface x, is mirror dual to f if I have the following equality uh, gx hat, I'll explain of t equals pi f of t. And this is an equality which should hold in the ring of formal power series with complex coefficients, c double brackets, t. So what are these gx hat and um, pi f? <coughs> um, gx hat is the power series m equals 0 to infinity cm t to the m, where uh, c0 equals 1, c1 is by definition 0, and for m bigger than or equal to 2, I have uh, cm to be equal to m factorial times the sum, and the sum is taken over all beta in the second homology of x whose uh, intersection with the anti canonical effects equals to n. And for each such beta, the sum atom that I have is a gravitational descendant of genus 0, one mark point, homology class beta, of point with the psi class raised to the power n minus 2. So that's gx hat of t. And this is called the regularized quantum period regularized because I've regularized it with this, adding this factorial. Uh, this is the regularized quantum period of x. 
and um, and pi f of t is defined by uh, as an integral, this particular integral over uh, two circles, x equals y sufficiently small radius, 1 over 1 minus tf integrated against the standard <coughs> And uh, so if you take this integral and apply the Cauchy residue theorem, uh, one variable Cauchy residue theorem twice, you'll find that this equals the, form of the power series k equals 0 to infinity constant term f to the k. In other words, it's the generating function for constant terms appearing in successive powers of f. And this thing is called the, uh, the classical period. So let me make some, uh, some remarks. Um, so I'm not an expert in ground witten theory, but to those of you who, who are, let me say that gx hat of t is the identity component of the j function of, f, uh, of x uh, suitably regularized. Uh, gx hat of t satisfies a, a differential equation, which is known as the regularized uh, quantum differential equation. And pi f of t satisfies uh, also a differential equation called the picard fuchs equation for f. And uh, under mirror symmetry, the conjecture is that the picard fuchs <coughs> equation should match up with the regularized quantum differential equation, possibly after some uh, suitable transforms. And so uh, this is somehow trying to then make precise the notion that uh, f is one of the uh, gromov witten theory effects. So you just insist that the solutions to these equations are the same, or rather the equations are the same, up to some transform. So once you have this notion of, um, of uh, linear duality, a natural question to ask is whether the same Fano manifold, a given Fano manifold admits a unique mirror dual. And the answer is immediately uh, no. And let me give you the standard example here. So non-uniqueness, uh, can people see this side, or would you, uh, would people prefer I start from the Okay, no preference. Uh, non-uniqueness non of mere duals. So, so I should say that I will often abbreviate uh, mirror duality or mirror dual by MD. So take the simplest final surface, that's P2, and consider, for, first of all, note that it's smooth, so it's a class TG, so it falls within the framework we want to consider, and then uh, let's define three Laurent polynomials, F1, which is this familiar Laurent polynomial, F2, which is uh, x, y squared plus uh, 1 plus x divided by y, and F3, which is uh, x, y squared times 1 plus x squared plus 1 divided by 2. So three Laurent polynomials. And the claim is that uh, if I take the regularized quantum period for P2, then it equals the, quant uh, the classical period of each of the Laurent polynomials Fi. And more precisely, both of these equal the formal power series uh, k equals 0, infinity. 3k factorial over k factorial cubed to the 3k. And so later on we'll see some technology that will help us uh, understand this a little better, but indeed uh, for the moment uh, it would be an interesting exercise to see why this is the classical period corresponding to this one for them. And so let me just make a remark as we are uh, already here that in fact P2 has not just finitely many meridules, it has infinitely many. Mirror 
duals corresponding to to uh, solutions, integral solutions of the of a very familiar Diophantine equation. This is called the Markov equation: three x y z equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So this equation appears in particular in the work of uh, Hacking and Prokhorov, which is quite influential for this, uh, this set of work that we're doing. But if, if effectively, this is a sort of reformulation of the formula for the degree of P2. <coughs> um, so at the end, the construction that I give you at the end uh, will allow you to construct infinitely many dual long polynomials for yourself, given that you, uh, what if you know a solution to the Markov? Okay, so in fact, what the situation is uh, not quite unique, uh, not quite one to one. We have infinitely many mirror duals in general, and so what one might hope, because ultimately you want to uh, sort of pick out fan of varieties by uh, by matching them up with a mirror dual Laurent polynomials, is that all of these uh, Laurent polynomial duals are related to each other via some equivalence relation. And so the conjecture. Can you, can you arrange these solutions all in this tree-shaped thing that is in the previous talk? So yes. So this uh, there is a tree of solutions okay. to the Markov equation, and uh, that appears in this framework as well. Uh, so the conjecture. And so I should say it's a conjecture, but uh, also there's a lot of experimental evidence to back it up. Is that any two? Mirror duals to X are uh, they are related under pullback by a sequence of uh, by a sequence of algebraic mutations. So uh, we'll, those, we'll come to those in a second. So while we're here, let me also give you another conjecture, which focuses more on where one might go about, how one might go about trying to find mirror duals, and sort of where the mirror duals of class TG fan of varieties come from. So suppose that I have X of class TG. The first bit of the conjecture says that if F is mirror dual to x, meaning I have that equality on the previous board, then um, x admits <coughs> a qg degeneration to uh, a toric final variety on the toric final uh, surface defined by uh, the spanning fan of Newton polyter So spanning fan being the fan over the faces in N, not the inner normal fan in N. And secondly, the converse, X admits a long polynomial mirror, uh, or rather a mirror dual long polynomial, or every Generation for every uh, degeneration uh, to the toric fan surface. <coughs> so, I guess in a nutshell, it's saying that if you want to construct mirror duals, you should look at degenerations of x to toric fan of varieties. Uh, for every uh, few G in English. I apologize. So if I forget to forget to mention it, all the deformations that I'm considering have to have this Q-Born stuff. Okay. Now um, let me just address the first conjecture for a second and begin to say a little bit about what algebraic mutations are. Okay, 
So let me give the definition. Algebraic mutations. Uh, so I'll make a comment on this uh, immediately, but let me give you the definition first. So these are uh, birational maps. Um, so throughout, I'll denote algebraic mutations by uh, phi. And they're birational maps of C star squared, because I'm in the surface case. Um, and they're of the form. So in other words, they're birational maps that I can decompose as a composition, gamma done after phi A done after eta or gamma then after the inverse of this map called phi a then after eta. Uh, and in this, uh, in this notation, gamma and eta are maps are of the form. So let x and y be coordinates on your, your domain torus. And then they take, so then these transformations take x, y to x to the a, y to the b, x to the c, y to the d, or uh, some matrix a, b, c, d in, in, in the general linear group of two by two matrices and in two matrices. So gamma and eta are just changes of coordinates. They're not particularly deep things. Uh, the real meat of the algebraic mutation are these, uh, these maps called phi a. And what do they do? These, uh, and these phi a take the coordinates x and y to uh, x, and then a of x times y, where uh, a of x is a long polynomial in one variable s. In this case, it's a long polynomial in one variable. So this uh, notion of algebraic mutation to, uh, to many of the people in the audience will be nothing particularly striking. It's uh, a notion that's appeared, you know, related, related notions have been known for a very long time in the cluster algebra literature. And uh, most, uh, more recently, uh, such transformations, similar transformations, appeared in the work of Galkin and Usnich, which is a sort of inspiration uh, for this kind of setup. And so the main point here isn't that we can define algebraic mutations in two dimensions, but more in more higher dimensional settings as well. But that's not uh, something we'll discuss today. Uh, and so these are, uh, these are phi A's, the meat of algebraic mutations, are really cluster type transformations. The main uh, lemma from the perspective of this program that algebraic mutations should satisfy is that if I have two wrong polynomials f and g, in uh, x and y, and uh, g is the pullback of f, by some algebraic mutation, uh, then the uh, classical period of G has to equal the classical period of F. And this is, uh, this is not really a deep, deep result. You just take the integral description of pi F and you, um, and you just apply the algebraic mutation and sort of work through the details and you immediately find that this is true. Some examples. First of all, I uh, I gave you earlier three uh, Laurent polynomials, and I claimed that they were all mirror dual to x, being p2. Let's uh, first let me start by showing you that all of these are related by algebraic mutations. So let me take gamma to be the identity, a to be the constant Laurent polynomial 1, and let me take eta to be equal to the transformation <coughs> coming from the matrix 1, 2, 0, minus 1. Then, um, then if phi is the algebraic mutation corresponding to these choices, I find that f2 is the pullback f1 under, the, under phi. To relate f2 and f3, let gamma equals e to each be the identity, let a equals 1 plus x, <coughs> then uh, f3 is a pullback by f2 of f2 by the corresponding algebra. Let me make one more example. 
uh, which is just not, not, again, not a deep example, but something that one really should keep in mind while trying to work with these things, because I used the word cluster type transformation earlier, which is if g is uh, 1 divided by y, and if I take gamma and eta to be the identity again, a to be 1 plus x, then um, and I pull back g by the, by the resulting algebraic mutation, then I get 1 over y times 1 plus x. So in particular, this is a rational function in x and y, but it's not a Laurent polynomial. And so one uh, shouldn't assume that algebraic mutations will take Laurent polynomials to Laurent polynomials. Uh, so Laurent polynomials do not uh, map to Laurent polynomials. Under algebraic notation. And typically, the situation one is usually interested in is when you have two Laurent polynomials and you know that they are related by algebraic mutation, or you want to relate them by a sequence of algebraic mutations. So, so just as a, as a quick review. We've defined these uh, final varieties of class two types, and we want to classify them up to Q-Borenstein deformation. Um, and so we also know what it means for such final varieties to be very dual to Laurent polynomials. Although the and the of the, com the combinatorial bit will come in a second, but then a natural question to ask at this stage is how one would compute these mere dual Laurent polynomials in practice. So that's uh, something that I'd like to address presently in the next uh, section. And so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, finding uh, Mirdul Laurent polynomials. So, recall now the second conjecture. The first conjecture said that all two mirror, any two mirror duals are related by algebraic mutation. But the second conjecture said that if you want to find mirror duals, then you should really start considering uh, degenerations of x to toric final varieties. Somehow the key idea then is not to think of x degenerating to toric final varieties, but to start with toric final varieties as the primary object. So the idea is to treat toric final uh, surfaces as primary objects. And, uh, and once you do this, you're in the realm of toric geometry, so it's possible to sort of use some combinatorial machinery that we didn't have before. In particular, let me say that uh, toric final varieties, toric final surfaces, uh, so under in this toric geometry world, they correspond to things called final polygons. Final polygons. And what's the definition? Suppose um, that I have uh, a lattice n of rank 2, since we're in the case of surfaces, a lattice polygon P in uh, the vector space obtained by tensoring Z2 with, uh, with the real numbers, so it's just in R2, is final <coughs> if satisfies three conditions. The first condition is maximal dimension, uh, dimensionality. So what I mean by that is the dimension of P should equal the rank of the ambient lattice. And that in this case is two. The second condition, so that I have dual polygons, is that uh, the origin should lie in the strict interior of P. And the third, somehow most important condition, 
is that uh, if I have a vertex V of P, then, uh, then if I, and I consider the line segment joining the origin to this vertex V, then that line segment contains only two lattice points, namely the endpoints 0 and V themselves. All it says is that there is no lines, uh, there is no lattice point on the strict interior of the line segment joining the origin to any of the vertices of P, and this condition is called primitivity, and it ensures uh, so in, it ensures that uh, the dual polygon encodes uh, the anti-canonical divisor of the target variety determined by the spanning plan. This is kind of important since we're considering final varieties. The anti-canonical ray really is something we want to keep track of. Is that more general than reflexivity? Yes. Reflexivity means everything, uh, all the lattice points need to be at height 1 over the origin. But this is slightly more, um, more general. For example, P113 is not reflexive. Is fine. So, um, so you use the same condition in high dimensions too? Same de definition, only you say that it, you remove the yeah. two in the okay. place. So, uh, okay, so let me consider uh, n equals z2 and just uh, very quickly give you examples and non examples of finite polygons. So, uh, this is the polygon that one might use to define P2. Um, so this is an R2, and vertices is 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So this is Fano. One can check the definition or you know, somehow secretly also read it easily because it corresponds to the part right 2. Here's something that's not Fano. So by the way, in my diagram, the x always denotes the origin. So here's something that's not Fano. Uh, and that's because this point 2, 0, if I take the, or the line segment joining the origin to this point, the, it has 1, 0 in the strict interior. This is not final because it, uh, it uh, violates condition C. And then uh, a more sort of degenerate example would be to just consider the line segment joining uh, minus 1, minus 1 to uh, 1, minus 1 inside R2. And again, this is not final. Because not only is it of the wrong dimension, that is, it violates condition A, it also doesn't have the origin in its strict interior. So it violates condition B as well. So we were interested in finding mere dual Laurent polynomials. And the hope, or the aim, is to um, obtain Laurent polynomials via some method. supported on final polygons, by which I mean the Newton polygon of these uh, wrong polynomials will be a final polygon. Uh, and, and, I and I hope that these wrong polynomials I've gotten are uh, mere dual to uh, some TG kind of service. Um, constructing such uh, mirror duals. So the key tool for such computations is, uh, is something called combinatorial mutations. This is common, notion of combinatorial mutations works for more general polygons, but it behaves particularly well when your polygons are finite, or polytopes, if you're working in high dimensions. And um, <clears throat> the idea, when you want to define it, I won't give you the precise definition, but in the case of surfaces, there is one sort of 
example that illustrates more, more or less all the features of the general case. But the idea underlying it is that if I have Laurent polynomials f and g in two variables, or more generally in the same number of variables, and, um, and say uh, g is a uh, pullback of f by an algebraic notation, uh, then the Newton polygon of g uh, is, a, is a combinatorial mutation of the Newton polygon. And uh, so, actually, what's the reference to this thing? For uh, what about this thing? Oh, <coughs> yeah. It's that paper um, uh, ACGK. It's called Minkowski polynomials and. So this is something like for the three-dimensional case, no? Uh, there's a there's a uh, this definition is given in all dimensions in that paper. Okay. And uh, I think you're referring to another paper of uh, Tom Coates and Alessio Porti, Golishev and all, where they try to reproduce these sort of final threefolds with very ample line bundle, okay. uh, a very ample anti-canonical by this mere duality matching. And the notion of algebraic mutation appears in that as well. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the idea. And here is the illustrative example. Uh, suppose that, uh, well, in fact, recall, uh, so using the same notation as earlier, that F3 was uh, a pullback of F2 by the algebraic mutation by A, where A was 1 plus X. And so here's, uh, here's the Newton polygon of F2. I'll, I'll recall what F2 is in, in a moment. <coughs> it's uh, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 1, and 0, minus 1. I should say this is uh, this p2 in, in a different in a different basis than uh, than one is used to. So that's new f, and uh, and it transforms. So L, we call f2 is x y squared plus uh, uh, one plus x over x y. So one over x y gives you minus one minus one. One plus x gives you the line segment x y squared gives you. This. And, and it transforms under this combinatorial mutations procedure to 1, 2, 2, 2, to this polygon here, uh, which is uh, 1, 2, 3, 2. Notice this is also a final polygon. And uh, this is the final 2, minus 1, minus 1. And this is the Newton polygon of uh, F3, which I recall was um, xy squared into 1 plus x all squared plus uh, 1 over x squared. And so what's really going on here, well, notice that it's just every time I pull back by this algebraic mutation, I replace y by 1 plus x times y. So I've got a 1, one over y here. And once I do the pullback, it cancels, the 1 plus x appearing cancels this 1 plus x here. And so this line segment collapses to this point by that <coughs> And up here, I've got y squared, which is replaced by y squared 1 plus x all squared. And so this point here expands to, uh, to this uh, line segment of length 2. So really, the intuition here is that in two dimensions, combinatorial mutation is really a collapsing and an expanding process uh, of your polygon in positive and negative types, uh, uh, negative and positive types, respectively. And so the key heuristic, just to repeat, is that um, replacing um, y to the k by y to the k times 1 plus x all to the k corresponds to expanding or collapsing um, uh, a line segment of uh, length k at height k with 
respect to, in this particular example, uh, the vector in the dual space 0, 1. Uh, and just um, while we're here, uh, an important uh, first example in this uh, set of ideas is that the combinatorial mutation graph of uh, P2 is isomorphic to the graph of solutions of uh, solutions again to the same equation to uh, the Markov equation. And this is where you see that graph, uh, the infinite tree coming up uh, in this in this story. So finally, finally, right at the end, let me give you uh, an example of computing these rare duals and, um, and sort of make some remarks related to that. Example. And we'll do two examples simultaneously to illustrate the general method. First, consider this lock as polygon. So that's uh, two one. Notice this is final. And uh, also this um, this lock is polygon. Pardon me? Hush is an object. What is that? Thank you. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and so I have this one. Uh, this one. And so this is. Uh, So the method takes as, it, as its input some, uh, some final polygon, any final polygon that you want. And here is what you do. You start by putting <coughs> zero on the origin. So given a final polygon, if I want to make a Laurent polynomial, I really have to decorate the coefficients, decorate the lattice points of this polygon with some coefficients. So the first step is to decorate the origin with the coefficient zero. And the reason for that is because I want this uh, this matching to hold, this uh, matching with gx hat, well, I want the constant term of f to be 0 in order to match this c1. And the constant term of f is the term coming from the uh, from the interior of x point 0. So I do that, and then the next thing I do, as a matter of convention, is not really a, a sort of deep reason at the moment that I can give you. You put ones on the worst. And then you put unknowns at all other lattice points. Imagine I've done that. And so what this gives you is it gives you a family of Laurent polynomials supported on your final polygon, parameterized by the unknown coefficients. Then, recall that, so then what I can do, I can, for every combinatorial mutation of my final polygon, I can associate an algebraic mutation of the, of the general member of the family that I've just constructed. And I recall, by the example on that border right at the end, is that not every algebraic mutation will preserve the property that the Laurent polynomial is, uh, is, a, is a Laurent polynomial. It may go to a rational function. But then I insist that, it, that, that under every algebraic mutation, coming from the combinatorial mutations that I have, my general member of this family has to remain a Laurent polynomial. And what that amounts to, it amounts to putting conditions on the unknown coefficients. And so in this way, we can determine a lot of the coefficients and sort of cut down the uh, sort of parameters in our space. So consider this example, and consider this line segment here. So under combinatorial mutations, if I, uh, I could collapse this line segment to uh, a point, and 
by this heuristic that would amount to uh, dividing a polynomial of degree 4 by 1 plus x to the 4th. And I want this polynomial to remain a Laurent polynomial after this division. And so there's some linear equations to solve. And you essentially, um, and what you get is you have to put binomial coefficients on this edge. And by analogy, you can do the same on this edge and on the edges outside. Similarly here, I have to do a division of degree 3 uh, by 1 plus x to the 3. So I have to put those binomial coefficients such as. For these unknown points, is this is at height, uh, so if I, if I put my you know, y direction in this, sort of, uh, in this general, so if I look at this direction, this is at height minus 1 with respect to, say, 1, 0 in the dual space. And so I don't really have too much time, but this effectively boils down to dividing a polynomial of the form 4 plus unknown x plus 4x squared by uh, 1 plus x, and I want that to remain Laurent. Uh, so I have to have a sort of binomial coefficient here, but the 4s on the edge force me to have not have a 2, but have an 8. And indeed, this determines all the unknown coefficients, and there's a unique Laurent polynomial supported on this final polygon. Considering this particular final polygon, it turns out, although again there's not so much time, that this particular uh, vertex remains unknown. And the reason is that it's impossible to touch anything inside this cone, the cone over this edge, by an algebraic mutation, or by, a, by a combinatorial mutation. Essentially, it's because uh, the singularity over this cone is something you can't smooth away when you do a cube Bornstein degeneration. And so there's a one parameter family of Laurent polynomials supported on this particular fault. And so that's the general method. And the conjecture is every time you do this method and you sort of end and you have nothing else to do, the Laurent polynomials you get are mirror dual to some TG final surface. Indeed, this is the case in experimental. Uh, in, in all experiments done so far. So this particular uh, Laurent polynomial is very dual to the del Pezzo surface of, uh, of degree 2. And this one parameter family of uh, Laurent polynomials is mere dual to uh, the blow up of uh, P113 in, in, in three general points. So every time you do this, even and the parameters somehow also appear on the ground with theory side as well. And every time you, uh, you care to try to do this, you always find some sort of mirror duality of this form. This is somewhat mysterious, and we'd like to understand it, of course. But uh, that we're not quite there yet. But nonetheless, let me conclude with some evidence that this whole framework actually does something that we want. First example is that classically we know that there are 10 um, smooth final surfaces up to deformation. Uh, there are, in fact, it turns out there are 10 final polygons uh, with something which we didn't have time to discuss, but uh, which somehow captures the singularities of the Fano. Uh, so this thing is called the singularity content. If you're interested, the second reference AK on the uh, board that I dropped off uh, uh, contains this. You can, I can give it to you later. Uh, and it has singularity content, some number of, uh, some number of uh, so smoothable bit and, uh, and the empty set. And so you have 10 and 10. And if I decorate these 10 final polygons with Laurent polynomials in this way, I get a one-to-one -one correspondence by a duality. And uh, just a final example to wrap up. Uh, there are 29 final surfaces uh, with uh, something called a residual basket. Being a k, being a set of singularities, some number k of the third one-one singularities. 
This means that if I smooth them away, if I do a cube Einstein smoothing, the only thing that's left that's not smoothed out is some number of one third one one singularities. And these 26 are of class TG. You can eliminate the remaining three by the trick that we discussed right at the beginning. <coughs> And then there are 26 finer polynomials. Uh, with, uh, with singularity content. Uh, some number of uh, smoothable bits. And uh, k times the third one, one. And indeed, one decorate, can decorate these with uh, families of Laurent polynomials in this way. And once you do the matching, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence via mere dual. So, so um, I'll stop there. What I want to say is somehow, I hope that at least uh, I've given you an idea of what sort of the general framework is, and hopefully I've managed to give you some evidence that this is an interesting set of ideas to pursue. And uh, in particular, a very interesting question would be to try and understand what the meaning of these, uh, this construction is from a sort of more geometric point of view. And if you have any ideas, I'd love to discuss them, but I'll leave, leave, it, leave it at that for now, please. Uh, any questions? It'd be great. Thank you. Questions or comments? There is something like that. There is 10 final polygons or two mutations, right? Of them. Yes. And this n is like 12 minus the degree of the funnel? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. It's the, from the mutation's point of view, it's the number of t-singularities on your polygon. So if you take the cone over your edges, then you have a cyclic quotient singularity, and you can break them up into uh, these residual singularities, things you can't smooth away, and some number of uh, t-singularities which were studied by color Shep and Byron. Those are the ones which you can smooth away. And those are recorded in this number. The number of T singularities is recorded here. And uh, you can give a formula for the degree in terms of the singularity content. And that precisely is the thing that you're asking. What's the status of the program in dimension three? In dimension three? Mm. Okay, so. Sorry. So a lot of the. Um, so there's an initial paper that came up a long time ago where people did uh, classify these uh, final threefold, smooth final threefolds with very ample anti-canonical class. There were 98 of those. And at the time, they gave a sort of ad hoc construction of raw polynomial software mirror. So now this construction that I've said uh, that I showed you for surfaces has now been generalized to all dimensions. And it turns out the old um, Laurent polynomials are a subset. So somehow it seems that if you go via this sort of general procedure, you can recover at least the classification of smooth finite threefolds. However, uh, so a lot of the concepts that we discussed uh, carry over mere duality, algebraic mutations, combinatorial mutations, this uh, general construction of Laurent polynomials. However, I don't believe that in general you have a one to one correspondence. So sometimes you have uh, final varieties that seem to go to two different uh, Laurent polynomials but don't have the same classical theory. So there's some sort of thing, some issue that may, I think, needs to be resolved uh, at that stage. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the conjecture about the um, Laurent polynomials related by mutations, is it known? Is it known? Like, are, are there counterexamples when um, there are two Laurent polynomials related by mutations that aren't mere dual to something that still have different pi pi f's. Are you so, so can I repeat? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it possible? Are you asking? Is it possible for you to have a final or a final, uh, say, n fold, which degenerates to two different hard varieties, and those hard varieties have somehow different uh, long polynomial mirrors? Oh, oh no, no. I'm asking like if if um. <coughs> Like, is, assuming that if you just consider long Laurent polynomials without, um, it, like, assuming that they're mirror dual to some x, then, but you do know that they're related by algebraic mutations, then is it possible that their pi f's are different? Because, like, like, it's conjecturally said when they are mirror dual to something. 
but just like for any two polynomial, or uh, one polynomial. So algebraic mutations is somehow uh, defined independently of this mere duality. Right. If you have two long polynomials related by algebraic mutations, then their pi episodes are the same. This is a this is proof. Oh, the and 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 conversely. If the pi f's are the same, I don't think that there's a sort of converse. No, I, I don't think there's a uh, Oh, so it's open even just for arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, think, I think so. Is that, is that an answer? Yeah, yeah. Okay, if there's no further questions, let's thank the speaker again.